All right, YouTube, this is PlayStation Repair Augusta putting out another video as promised. In fact, I think I spoke about this one in the last video, and there's still an update to come to that one. We have actually found a solution for that Xbox, but right now the topic is about PS4 power supplies. This one that came in was a unique opportunity, and I've been considering now for a while how to exactly go about doing a power supply video. Often I get the question, is it repairable or should I just replace it? And we're going to try to answer that. That answer may or may not be what you were looking for, but in my opinion and experience, it'll be the answer that I would give myself if I'm asking the question to repair or replace. So, First off, let's talk about what's going on exactly with this power supply. And I am going to switch between camera views and I'm going to show it in the overhead so you can get a general sense. And then also we're going to look at some things in the microscope. Now this particular power supply came in recently and was opened up. And it is probably by far the worst case of a power supply failure that I have seen to date. Typically, PS4 power supplies fail in a manner that is almost, by large in part, undetectable to the naked eye. You need to be looking at it with a microscope and you may or may not see blown components. There's a lot of driver circuitry that goes on in switch mode power supplies and those tend to go bad. And without schematics or some type of diagnostic info other than just experience and maybe a working device to compare against you're kind of probing in the dark except for just general components like MOSFETs capacitors and capacitors you can have failures that without special testing equipment doesn't necessarily mean expensive but you need to be able to check for ESR values and other um, instances that can cause issues what we want to talk about here though is what particularly failed on this one and we're also going to generally kind of walk through the flow of how these power supplies work and then we're going to talk about the determination of whether or not this one would be repaired or replaced. Now I'm sure that everyone can see from the video we've got a huge wound area right here on the power supply and that makes it evident and very clear what's going on with this particular unit. We have a failure right here in the center and it caused some major issues. Now we also have, let's talk about in general. Let's look at the power supply as a whole. There's actually three steps to this power supply. On any power supply, you're going to have that mains divider, where here we have our 120 volts AC coming in through the wall. Now, I feel that it's, and I probably should have a banner, it needs red, flashing, blinking, crazy in your face warnings that this is the part that could take your life. If you don't know what you're doing inside of a power supply, do not open it. I am not making this video to train you. This video is more for people that have experience with working on power supplies and just haven't had the time, energy, or desire to really dive in and explore it, or if you're just curious about the theory and how it works. But again, if you don't know what you're doing, I recommend not tinkering around in this area of the PlayStation. If, if that's the case for you, if you even doubt its viability, chunk it, toss it, throw it away. And Anything that I say in here may or may not be 100% accurate. I'm not an engineer. There's people that are certainly more qualified online to talk about this than I am. And this is where we go through the disclosure part, is that everything that I'm telling here is not from a trained professional electronics engineer. This is from a person that has worked on electronics long enough to get in there and had enough disregard for his own safety in life that I was able to learn enough on how to be safe with these. There is a way to discharge power supplies, but again, to get into them, to discharge them, you're going to run a risk of self-harm. 
So I do not recommend that anyone open up their power supply. If you do so, you do so at your own risk. And I cannot be held liable for what happens to you if you decide to open up throughout all the seals on that device that say do not open and tinker inside of that. I'm sure PlayStation has the same stance that they will not be held in harm if you open up a device that they made and it then takes your life, especially when they have warning labels all throughout. Or at least it's imprinted in the plastic. Maybe they should also make it quite a bit more clear. However, let's get back to the topic. This is our main side. We got 120 volts AC. There's a line, and some of these are configured different. There's a lot of different power supply models, some that even slightly change in the same iteration of the console. Pretty much every iteration change of the console from SAA to SAE all have different power supplies. Pretty much they work the same, but configuration, components, things will be different. But what will stay true is this general format that I'm going to give you now. Mains 120 volt resides within this section. There's your dividing line. Just because it transfers over and goes off of that, a lot of people think that this means that this is where the danger ends. Danger is here too. In fact, up until we get to this side, there's still voltages that are certainly able to take your life. Now it's a little bit less dense with those voltages over here, but certainly more dense with them here. And again, there are still voltages here that exceed a level of safety for human life. So if you value yours, again, do not touch, do not open, do not proceed. Go back, get another one. They're cheap enough that it's not worth you risking your own safety. So now, once we transfer from this, we are still in a high current application, but we're switching at this dividing line from AC power to DC power. Everything after this diode becomes DC converted. And then what we're doing is an exchange of um, up converting, down converting, switching, and driving power to drive other components within the circuitry here so that we end up with our rated power for our PlayStation. Now, as we progress down the next session, a section that divides, again, all of this is just driving current for switch mode power supply, it's, it's driver ICs, it's um, fault protection circuitry, and as you can see, it's, it's quite complex. This is a densely populated power supply. In comparison to, you can find knockoffs, which these come extremely cheap, they're most likely, even though they say new, all from pooled units. Maybe someone out there is cloning them, but as far as I've seen, most of the clones are very good quality, but there are some fakes out there that are just really shoddy quality. It tends to be more so on the Xbox power supplies and less so on the PlayStation side. However, you're still going to find them in both areas. So again, you want to make sure you're buying from a trusted source because what I've seen from those power supplies that are not up to snuff is that they are almost guaranteed to fail and in a lot of cases they can actually damage your system rather than help it. They may get you back up and running for a short while but they will eventually go kaboom and when they do they sometimes, not always, take out your console with it. And again this issue is more predominant on fakes and clones that exist for the Microsoft side. There are very few that even bother to do it for the PS4 and I'm assuming that's just due to abundance of supply because so many units have been sold and so many units have been refurbished and I'm sure even more of them have been discarded and new ones bought again. Otherwise the repair market would not exist. So again we go from 120 volts AC then we get into our DC high current. We actually have voltages here up to and this is only applies if you're in the US because when we convert from AC to DC that voltage will step up and that is why these capacitors, because this is an international standard, is rated for 450 volts. Here in the U.S., at 120 out of the outlet, you're going to see about 170 volts DC inside of these capacitors. And you will see voltages ranging from 20 to, I want to say, 100, or sorry, about 70, 
volts DC that are on some of the circuitry in between. But again, I haven't even probed all of the contact points. The, there's certainly probably some stuff that I've missed in this. I've done many different power supply repairs across different models. And I've also had a lot where I've said it's just not worth it. In order to find out the difference between the two, I've spent countless amount of hours taking them apart, putting them back together, comparing and analyzing between dead and functional units. So we come back to our high voltage where we said we've got everything ranging from maybe just a couple of volts up to that 170 volt mark, which is where our AC main caps out on that uh, conversion to DC. Now that's not to say they couldn't step that voltage up somewhere else, but as far as I know, there's no more up conversion on the voltage to go beyond 170 volts DC. They're pretty much just stepping down from that supply. Now they may step down a voltage and then up convert it back to another level, but nothing that I've seen is going above that 170 volts mark. Now if you're in a European nation where you have uh, 220 coming out of the wall, then most likely you're going to be seeing your voltage on its high DC side. I think that rate of conversion would be somewhere close to around um, 300 volts. So that is why they have this 450 volt tolerance. You get into some really, really dangerous voltage at that level. And it, the likelihood of something going wrong only becomes massively more so. So again, do not attempt this if you don't know what you're doing. If you do know what you're doing, you probably still shouldn't attempt it. These have gotten cheap enough to where they're easy to replace. But if you want to tinker and you are qualified to do so, you do so at your own risk. Now, once we get past our high voltage DC, we get into our low voltage side. And again, that's not to say that this over here is safe. But most of our voltages here are going to be around uh, 25 volts or less. And then a large majority of that is going to be that 5 and 10 volt rail. This is actually the part of power that is going into the PlayStation. And when we talk about that, there are two contact points. We have our power on our main side, which is our 12 volt, and this is our highest amount of amps, come from this port here. Then we have our kind of our, our communication connection. And if you look on the board, you'll see that it says standby, it says ground, it says five volt standby. And then we have, uh, what is our, our, um, our fifth one here? I think it's actually, there is a double ground and that is what is on this one. Some power supplies will only have four, some power supplies will have two, but for the most part, their configuration is very similar in structure and in terms of operation. Now, the standby voltage is required to be sensed in order to detect that you've hit the power on switch. So if you're not getting power on, standby voltage could be an issue for you. If standby voltage is the only issue, then you're more than likely looking for something in this section of your power supply. However, because this is a switch mode power supply, what we actually have here is kind of this weird loop back where current is being driven on one end and then that is then sensed and detected in order to drive that current on another end and it's causing a switch and you're getting this back and forth and back and forth and that is what allows them to get a very high level of efficiency from this power supply and maximize your power in versus your power out or maximize your power out versus your power in I should say so that again you're not wasting as much energy. Old power supplies which are called linear power supplies were probably what like 40 60 percent efficient at best. These are going to be like 85 maybe even closer to 90. Uh, if you get really curious about power supply ratings look at computer power supplies and you'll see their efficiency ratings. Now they have this gold standard, silver standard, and then it's all probably, can't remember if it's a, if that color coding is just a manufacturer standard or if it's an industry. I didn't get into it as much there, but there is that rating of, you know, typically, I think, which one is it? The, I forget the name of the brand, but they like to go, it's a gold 80. And that 80 is 80% 80 efficiency is what they're basically conveying in the name of that power supply. 
Some of your common faults that you're going to see with these are things like your MOSFETs. MOSFETs like to go out. It's a very common failure point. However, it is usually not the only failure point when they're involved. Maybe 10% of cases I found where only a MOSFET was the issue. Maybe in less than five, I would dare to even say 2% or less, that it's just a fuse blown issue. And it's much easier to test for that, but again, involves testing in areas of the power supply which are dangerous. Uh, it, once I look more into how I want to go about addressing that, I may actually do a live repair of a power supply. If that's something you have interest in seeing, then certainly express it below in the comments and let me know so that I can gauge whether or not it's worth pursuing in terms of what I need to do to make sure that I've adequately addressed the safety concerns involved in that. Again, this is not a repair video. It's just kind of general overview for those that have already been inside of the device but are maybe unclear on some of the interactions that are taking place. And like I said, I'm by no means a specialist or an authority on power supplies. This is just the data that I've learned and gathered over years of tinkering with them. So we come back to this backside here and to kind of gather where I wanted to go up. Ah, I don't want to make this too long of a video. It's probably already been long enough. So what I wanted to do now was switch over to the microscope view and just show a close up of some of the damage. And then I'll give my synopsis as to whether or not I think this power supply is worth replacing, or sorry, worth repairing, or if it should just be replaced. So we're going to switch over to and we will leave the big view up but we're gonna go scope big so that it gets the primary focus and I actually found out a new secret with my scope and it's called parfocaling your microscope so the first thing you do is you zoom in on your subject and I'm about to change my lighting I'll try to get this brighter oh I went darker I wanted to go brighter there we go that's as bright as it will get so we change our focus to zoom all the way in so we're as close as we can get and then we use our up down movement to focus the camera view this way and then to par focal we are going to then zoom all the way out and we're going to use our eyepiece adjustments to focus our eyepieces and then because this is a trinocular we then focus the trinocular up and down which happens to already be in focus so now I can actually go all the way in and I can go all the way out without having to constantly adjust my up down. Now if I was to flip this over my height changes so as you can see that text gets out of focus. So when you change the height of your subject then you will have to readjust that par focaling but if your height of your subject is not going to change once you set it you're golden. And for this particular section, we won't need to reset for at least a little bit. Let's see if we can get in focus what I want to look at. Now, here is the direct opposite of what I showed earlier in the large camera. And this is where we have issues on both sides of the board. And we can actually see here a blown capacitor. I'm pretty sure that's blown. Now, that smoke could be from something else. We'd have to clean it up to determine. But we definitely have some charring in this area. This is what we talk about when using your eyes, using your nose, because you could probably smell it. This one looks pretty well damaged here as well. That diode certainly has decay on it. Look at that. That is just crumbling under the tweezers. So this area is going to need to be tested and probed, and more than likely, a lot of these are going to need to be replaced, especially this IC. I doubt highly that survived. Oh, and again, when we look at this side, no, it definitely did not survive. Now we're going to have to adjust that par focaling. 
And hopefully I'm saying that right, because I just learned this. And look at that, when I zoomed in, well, it went completely black on this, but we're out of focus. What happened to our camera there? Ah, we were too far zoomed in on something black and it caused it to just basically blank out the video. All right, so there we are focused and here I'm focused on my end, but you're not on yours. And I think that does it. All right, so now we're going to take a look at this. This is the top side of that chip, and this is that area that I talked about before, which had a huge amount of damage. And actually, before I even took this power supply apart, I have noticed that something was rattling around inside. And this is the first time I've seen this on a PlayStation power supply. The capacitor actually blew off its entire casing and exposed its internal elements. So here we have the winding of our capacitor and our electrolytic film inside has basically turned to like a fibrous dust. And you can see on this part we have that spillage of the electrolytic which is very corrosive and we have these like kind of hairs growing off of this where this fiber has just and that's probably from the shock of when all this made contact. And again, I would recommend replacing most of this. Now we may test it. Maybe some of these are still good, but the likelihood of them having longevity is not very likely. So replacing diodes, obviously this MOSFET, which has its legs blown off of it, or sorry, not MOSFET, this IC, which is a driver that's a DNP015. We've got, I think this is just a ferrite core um, what do they call these on the board? FB, I think is what it's called. But basically, it's just a straight through, kind of like a, a, a conditioning of sorts. And they rarely, rarely ever go bad. In fact, I mean, replacing that may be unnecessary because I just don't think they really do go bad. Not unless they explode. But there is this this white line on top, and that does not appear to just be surface. So... This may be toasted. And again, we could probe all this out, but that would make this video longer. That's not what this video is about. Again, like I said, this is a general overview. I doubt highly with all this energy that came through here, which again, I'd have to flip back over and look at the circuits and what protections lie in between. But we probably are going to notice that there's some damage to these MOSFETs here. And then if we flip back over and we just do another last check, we can see that this damage actually runs from this location here. And I think we've shown this well enough through the microscope because it just doesn't give you the whole idea. And it's kind of in the way from our general view. So we're going to go back and say this damage runs from here on our power supply to here and can involve a lot of that circuitry in between not to mention because there is is a, a driving in this switch mode that's going kind of back and forth we can still have issues in other parts of this board I doubt highly with the damage we've seen here that we have any problems on our main input side I doubt that we have much problems over here but I would find it unlikely if we did not see issues on both sides, the difference between our, our high voltage DC side and our, our transition into our low voltage, especially considering that this looks pretty well charred, which is one of our feedback lines that is doing some current sense operations. And again, without a schematic, I'm not 100% clear on exactly what all type of, of communication and driving is going on in this circuit but if I remember correctly on this model from testing in fact I'm looking here and this is feeding a direct runoff from our looks like standby voltage is actually no it goes through in here no I think it does it comes back around 
But again, I believe it connects and it goes through these transistors. There may be enough protection in between that it, it didn't run into our five volt supply. But again, just from experience, I've seen that when we do have driver issues this close to our final endpoint, that usually we're looking at something over here as well. Um, whether it be a MOSFET or this driver IC or a combination thereof. Um, also, you have some ICs here, which do also do some mitigation. But I believe, if I remember correctly, these are more involved in the 12 volt side. So we may be looking at a 5 volt problem and its communication points back and forth. And this is where somebody certainly more qualified than me could probably answer these questions just off of probing, testing, and kind of a visual examination with much more certainty than I could, and probably without spending as much time as I could. But those people don't seem to be interested in diagnosing and figuring out where the common failure points are on these power supplies. So again, if this is something you're already experienced with and you were looking for some clarity on what is going on inside, then this video may answer some of your questions, but it's certainly not a repair training video and not designed to teach people how to repair their power supplies. What we are able to determine from this is the amount of damage involved with it, the amount of time that it would take to probe without certainty of knowing how the schematic works, is that I would say, in, in my experience, this is not worth fixing. The cost of this power supply is about $35 if you're buying a pooled unit from a known working system, which I've seen very successful as replacements. However, a replacement supply has already been tested inside of the machine that this came out of, and guess what? The machine got burned in the process. So there's something board level that it now needs to be corrected and fixed on its, on its main power inputs because of what happened here. And if we look at what we see, we can make the assumption that something got stuck in what looks to be a shorted position, causing it to basically overamp and go critical. That's my assumption. Again, it's not a fact because I haven't proven any of this, but just off appearance, my opinion is that we had a short circuit. Whether that short originated on the board or originated in the power supply, either way, we now have an issue with our main logic board for this console. And without fixing that, it doesn't matter how many power supplies we put in, it's not going to work. The customer is still deciding whether or not that's a repair worth pursuing because we get into a lot of variables once we start chasing down these power issues. And initial probes and tests have not revealed anything that's clear and absolute. So it's going to require just good old fashioned diagnostic research. Probe, touch, feel, go until you find the culprit that has made that board incapacitated. For this one, like I said, for me it's an easy fix, and that fix is replace. And for anyone that has opened one of these and sees a similar situation, you're probably better off just replacing it. Except on the brand new, most newest console releases, those power supplies can be 100, 150, I think at one point the PlayStation Pro power supply, even the Slim, when it was brand new, getting a pulled replacement because they were so rare was like $180, $190. It was ridiculous, but that price quickly drops down to a reasonable number. So if you are without a power supply and it needs a replacement, if you've been to a repair shop and they tell you, you know, the power supply right now is really expensive and it's just not worth repairing, maybe they have another solution with you, such as they have a board they can swap you out with, because, or sorry, a a um, machine or a power supply of their own that they can swap you out with that they don't mind waiting till the price drops to get back. However, if the only answer is to pay that high price or to wait, my recommendation is just to wait. Whether that be the machine waiting with you or leave it with the repair shop until that power supply becomes available, uh, that option is yours to decide and also whether or not that repair shop wants to hold on to your device for that period of time. But certainly within 
three to six months, we usually see any new power supplies that are limited in supply quickly start to have attrition on their price point to where it becomes manageable and reasonable for a repair shop to put a swap in and replace you and get you going. But if you can't wait, if you have to be back up and running, there is someone out there that can repair those power supplies for you. There's plenty of people online that advertise that they do it. Um, not most, most of them are not talking about it, and that's probably, again, because of the risk issues of putting up videos, as well as uh, just, like I said, the amount of time that's been put into it and used to educate yourself in order to repair it. There are those that feel they need to recoup their investment on that time, and they're not going to share that information. That's not bad on them. It's the fact that they need to recoup the cost of what they have put into those repairs. And for the most part, these repairs quickly become unnecessary because those prices do fall so quickly. If you have a first gen PS4, there, even if I know how it can be fixed and I know that it's just one component, the likelihood of me fixing it, unless I just need one right now and I only have that one that can be fixed, I'm not going to do it because those power supplies have gotten very cost effective. But if you bring a PS4 Pro in and your power supply looks like it can be repaired versus being placed, replaced, chances are I'm going to take a crack at it because last I looked those were still around the $100 price range which once you add in labor and the other work involved quickly gets people to question whether or not it's worthwhile pursuing. However, with the cost of a PS4 Pro I would assume that that thought still quickly fleets from one's mind considering replacing that console is sitting around what three to five hundred dollars so again that is it for a power supply review like always I got a little bit ranty in this video I hope you learned something from it again this video is not to teach you how to open up and tinker inside of your power supply if you don't know what you're doing do not open these devices up it will potentially cost you your life. So again, that's all for today. Take care. Have fun. There may be another video today, but more than likely that will be tomorrow. I will see all of you in the next live stream.